John chapter 3. Let's open up our Bibles there and let me pray. Father in heaven, we pray for a blessing upon your word. We pray that you'd open up our hearts and our minds to receive the goodness and the power and the presence of your spirit. We pray it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 1, beginning now at verse 1, where we read, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3 begins with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a remarkable man. We're told actually several different facts about him there just in the few verses, three verses. First of all, we're told that he was a Pharisee, which means that he was kind of among the religious elite of his day, people who really took God and his word seriously. Secondly, we're told that he was a ruler of the Jews, which no doubt means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the governing council over the Jewish people at that time. He must have been an educated man because even though he was Jewish and a member of the Sanhedrin, he had a Greek name. Nicodemus is a Greek name, not a Hebrew name. So that probably points to the fact that him being an educated man exposed to Greek culture. And then he was also, as I should say before, an influential man, being a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night in a secret meeting with Jesus. Now, some people want to know, was Nicodemus afraid? Was Nicodemus afraid to be seen with Jesus? Perhaps that's the case. That's one possible suggestion. Another possible suggestion was he just saw how many people wanted to talk with Jesus during the day, and he wanted to get an uninterrupted interview with Jesus, and so he decided to come by night. But can you envision this whole scene? Two rabbis, Jesus of Nazareth, of course, and then this man Nicodemus, a teacher and a leader of the Jews, talking together at night over these very important matters. And he introduces himself to Jesus and saying, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, I don't know if he was just trying to flatter Jesus or making a sincere introduction, but he makes a very warm, kind statement to Jesus. Jesus, we're impressed by your miracles. Jesus, we're impressed by your teaching. And then Jesus answers back to him in a way that is so straightforward that I would never accuse our Lord of rudeness, but it seems almost rude what Jesus responded him to it. It seems like this is a man very warmly introducing himself to Jesus. And how does Jesus respond? Look at it there in verse 3. He says, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus was drawing on something that is a theme throughout the rest of the New Testament, but it even extends as well backwards into the Old Testament. This idea of the new birth, of somebody being transformed in their life. And Jesus looked at Nicodemus square in the eyes and he said, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Because unless someone is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I think this is probably a little bit of a shock to Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus would have thought, well, there are people in this world who need to be transformed. There are certainly people in this world who need to be born again, but not me. I'm religious. I'm a teacher of the Jews. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a ruler. I'm someone who has some status and some affluence in this world. But he says, no, no, no. It's not just for those who are Gentiles, perhaps, who would come into Judaism. By the way, that concept was very strong with the ancient Jews. They thought very strongly along these terms that a Gentile coming into Judaism had to be born again or transformed, but not someone who was already born a Jew. Now, most Jews of that time looked for the Messiah to bring in a new world where the Messiah reigned. But Jesus says, no, I want you to know that before I bring in a new world, I'm going to bring in a new life one by one through humanity. And in that new life, I will reign as preeminent. Therefore, in that new life, you must be born again. Now, that has become sort of a catchphrase in our society. I remember it very well. I mean, it's not so much today. But I remember it very well in the 1970s and the 1980s. People were talking about being a born-again Christian, as if that was a separate kind of Christian. In fact, I remember many conversations with people, and they'd say things like this. Well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a born-again Christian. 
Now, I understood perfectly what they meant by that. They kind of wanted to say this, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those crazy ones who takes it seriously. But when you see what Jesus said and take it seriously, that unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, then you realize there is only one kind of Christian, a born again one. And if you're not transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, if this idea of a new birth isn't real in your life in some way, then you don't really have this claim to say, I belong to Jesus' kingdom because I'm not going to see the kingdom of God unless I am truly born again. Now, you should know that the ancient Greek word that's translated there, again, it can also be translated from above. And some Greek scholars do it different ways. I don't know what particular translation you have in front of you, but it wouldn't surprise me if perhaps your translation said, born from above. But you know what? The idea is essentially the same. Whether you would translate it born again or born from above, we are born again from above. We're born above again. You get the idea. It's talking about a spiritual birth, a rebirth, an inner transformation within the person. Essentially, it means to have new life. Now notice this, verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Look, honestly, doesn't Nicodemus' question seem so ridiculous that you wonder if he's not being sarcastic? I, I wonder what the interplay was right here. Because obviously Jesus didn't mean that one should go back into his mother's womb and be born, reborn in a physical sense. That's obviously true. But Nicodemus' reply may not have been out of ignorance, but maybe he thought that Jesus meant moral reform. Maybe it was something like this, really, can you really teach an old dog new tricks? Aren't we just the way that we are, Jesus, and we're this way for the rest of our life? But he asked that question, how can a man be born when he is old? Jesus, I don't get this whole born again thing. Now, I think one of the interesting things that we need to understand when we consider this whole conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus is this is one rabbi speaking to another rabbi. And in just a few moments, Jesus is going to say something. I don't mean to be a spoiler here, but Jesus is going to say something, Nicodemus. He's going to say this. Are you not the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? In other words, Jesus is appealing to Nicodemus on the basis of things that he should have known. And so I think that the real key to understanding what Jesus means by being born again is found in what the Old Testament says about the new life. And this is what we find when we take a look at the Old Testament. At the Old Testament, there are many passages that speak of God's new covenant. There was a covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. That is often called the Old Covenant or the Mosaic Covenant or sometimes the Sinai Covenant. But it's a covenant that God made with Israel in the wilderness. Well, in the prophets afterwards, God repeatedly promised, I'm going to make a new covenant with people, a new covenant with humanity. And you could say that the new covenant that God promised had three basic aspects. Number one, it had the aspect of the gathering of Israel. That's what would happen. Number two, it had the aspect of the cleansing and the spiritual transformation of God's people. That was the second aspect. And then the third aspect, it would have the reign of the Messiah over Israel and over the whole world. Now, we have some evidence to believe that in Jesus' today, in, Jesus, in the Jewish world of Jesus' day, that many of the Jewish people, probably Nicodemus as well, they thought that the first two aspects had already been fulfilled. After all, after the Babylonian exile, they came back into the land. After all, there seemed to be religious movements that seemed like a revival movement and a back to the Bible movement, such as the Pharisees. In the minds of many Jewish people in Jesus' day, they had the gathering, they had the spiritual transformation, they were just waiting for the reign of the Messiah. And Jesus says, whoa, stop, come back with me. The spiritual transformation has not yet happened. And that's why Nicodemus couldn't get it. In Nicodemus' mind, they already had it. But Jesus said, no, you don't have it, and you must be born again. And that's why Jesus' statement about the new birth was so strange to Nicodemus. He thought that it had already been poured out upon the Jewish people, therefore they weren't looking for it. And that's why Jesus had to so seriously confront Nicodemus and say, you must be born again. As he says here in verse 5, notice, Jesus answered, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. You notice that? Verse 7, Jesus said it so emphatically, you must be born again. What he's just trying to say is that you and I, we don't need a moral reformation. We don't need a list of rules to kind of clean up our life and improve ourselves. This isn't to be found at the self-help section of the bookstore. This is the change your life section of the bookstore. This is being born again. And friends, this transforming power of Jesus Christ is one of the greatest witnesses that this world ever has. Now, if you notice it, he spoke about it in due terms, being born of the water and of the Spirit. And I can tell you, I have read dozens of commentators and theologians, and so many of them have their own opinions about what water and the Spirit are. Let me just cut to the chase and give you what the actual correct answer is. Since Jesus is referring back to the Old Testament and seems to be the, uh, that's the grounds that he's speaking on with Nicodemus, I genuinely believe that the water and the Spirit are two aspects of the new covenant promised in the Old Testament. For example, in the book of Ezekiel, he says that as part of the new covenant, he will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be cleansed and he'll fill you with the Spirit. So I think what he's talking about is in the new covenant, we are cleansed from our sins by what Jesus did on the cross and we are filled with his spirit as the gift of the spirit of God. This is this transformation that God does, taking someone from darkness into light. It's prophesied in the Old Testament, and water and the spirit are some of the aspects that are prophesied in the Old Testament. But don't miss it. Jesus Christ is here to transform lives. And this life-transforming power is one of the greatest evidences of Christianity. There was a great preacher and writer in the Christian world. Oh, I guess he did most of his works like in the 20s, 30s, and 40s of the previous century. But his name was Harry Ironside. And I read a story about Harry Ironside this week that I thought was really wonderful. Harry Ironside was a pastor and a preacher, and he was also a Bible commentator. And one day he was out preaching in San Francisco. Now, he had some appointments at churches to do some preaching, but he decided to go out on the streets and do some street preaching. So there he is out on the streets preaching, and he's getting quite a crowd around him. He's just doing a job telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. When up comes to him, a man who hands him a card. Now, I don't remember the man's name, but in his own day, that man was a very famous atheist. And so he challenged Ironside to a public debate regarding Christianity and atheism there in San Francisco. So you're going to be here for a few days. Let's debate this. Ironside thought about it for a few moments, and this is what he said publicly. He read the man's invitation on the card, and he said, let me tell you, I would like to accept this man's invitation on one condition. This is the only condition I ask. I'm happy to meet. I'm happy to debate. I'm happy to discuss. But here's what this man has to do. This man has to bring with him two people to the debate. One of them, I want to be a man who was totally enslaved to addictions, whether it be drug abuse or alcohol abuse, some of the man who had frittered away his whole life and had just given it to, to, to the dissipations of this world. And his life had been absolutely run. He was a gutter drunk or drug addict, a man who had been totally sold out to the addictions of this world and that atheism had transformed his life. Bring one of those men. And then he said, I want you to bring somebody else. I want you to bring a woman who's been a prostitute, a woman who's been just been so morally degraded in her life that you look into her eyes and there's just a hollowness there. There's just an emptiness in her whole life because she's been trapped in this system that's robbed her of her own soul. And she's so low. She's so beaten down. And I want you to bring that woman and have her stand up and give a public testimony that her life has been utterly transformed by the power of atheism in her life. So when he gave those conditions for the debate, he said, I'll add one more thing. You just bring two people who have had their lives transformed by the power of atheism, and I'll bring a hundred people who have had their lives transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. So when he made that challenge, the atheist smiled and respectfully declined. Because what could he do? Because what could he do? Ladies and gentlemen, there is life-changing power in the work of Jesus Christ. 
it's being born again. It's having new life. Now, this is where it confuses some people, is that some people have a definitive marking point. They say, man, I know I passed from death unto life, from darkness unto light on this date, at this year, I remember even the hour of the day. Some people have a very definitive marking point. And honestly, other people don't. Other people just kind of find out someday they're, they're, just, they're just walking with God and they, hey, wait a minute. What's happened in the last year? All I know is I'm a different person than I was a year ago. I can't even pinpoint a specific time or place or event, but I know I'm a new person. I know I'm a different person than I was a year ago. And we gotta be careful that we don't demand that every person's experience be just like ours. Isn't that a problem sometimes in the Christian world? We have a marvelous experience with Jesus Christ, and then I wanna judge you and your experience by my experience. No, we can't do that. So the principle of new life is firm and secure, but how God works it in the individual may differ a bit from individual to individual. But notice this, what he says in verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Without the birth of the spirit, who we are in our inner nature, it taints everything and all our works of righteousness. Yet everything that a spirit-led um, man or woman does can be pleasing unto God. And then Jesus says this really profound statement in verse 8. He says this, that the wind blows where it wishes. The idea to Nicodemus was something like this. Listen, you don't understand everything about the operations of the wind. You don't understand it all, but you can tell when it's blowing. And it's the same way with the work of the Spirit. We may not know where it's come from and where it's going. We may not know and understand all the operations of it. But here's the great thing. You don't need to understand everything about the work of the Spirit to benefit from the work of the Spirit and for Him to bring you new life. Now going on here, verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And if you do not receive our witness, and I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Nicodemus was confused. He says, how can these things be? He was so set in his thinking that some aspect of the new birth had already happened to the people of Israel. It's like, Jesus, I don't even understand what you're talking about. And that's why Jesus says to him in verse 10, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Nicodemus, you should know better. Nicodemus, you're a man who knows the Old Testament. You know the new covenant passages in the Old Testament. You know them. You should know what it means when I talk about the work of God through the water and the spirit. And then Jesus said something really radical to make it even more plain to Nicodemus. Look at verses 14 and 15 where Jesus says this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Isn't that beautiful? Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... You know, Jesus is illustrating what he means by describing something that happened in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. In the book of Numbers, chapter 21, the Israelites in the wilderness on their way from Egypt to Canaan had been very rebellious. They were a very rebellious bunch, and they were complaining against the Lord. And because of their sin, because of their rebellion, God sent fiery serpents to go and to bite the people. But yet God provided a way of salvation for everybody in Israel. And this is what he told Moses to do. He said, I want you to take a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole. And everybody who looks at that bronze serpent, they will be saved. And that's why Jesus says, look at it there in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What does he mean? Now, this is shocking to some people, and i got to say, it's a little bit shocking to me that Jesus illustrated his work on the cross by a serpent on a pole. Isn't that strange? But friends, I want you to notice this. The serpent is a picture of sin, of Satan, of rebellion. We associate serpents rightly with the work in the Garden of Eden and the fall of man. That's what we think of when we think of a serpent. But notice what the serpent was made of. 
The serpent was made with bronze. And in the Bible, bronze is a metal that's associated with judgment because it's made in fire. It's manufactured in fire. And so when God told them to build an altar for sacrifice where there would be sacrifice made, build it out of bronze because things are going to be judged there. So do you see what the picture of a bronze serpent represents? Yes, it's sin, but it's sin that's been judged. And what a perfect representation of Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross was nailed there as if he were the embodiment of sin, the worst sinner, every sinner collected into one, and the righteous judgment of God the Father was poured out upon him. And he becomes, in a sense, that bronze serpent lifted up. And even as the people of ancient Israel could look upon that bronze serpent and live, Jesus on the cross, he says to all of humanity, look upon me and live. Don't look to yourself. You're looking for the answer. Stop looking at yourself. Stop gazing at your own belly button. Look unto me. Look unto me, Jesus says, because I'm going to be lifted up. And he was lifted up on the cross. And there, looking unto him, would bring rescue to the world. And then we come to John 3, 16. Doesn't that just kind of roll off the tongue? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, this single verse, John 3, 16, has long been prized as one of the best succinct one-sentence descriptions of the great work of Jesus Christ and how people can come into it. I know you may associate it, and I'm dating myself just a bit with this, but you may associate with guys with rainbow wigs and, you know, and, and holding up a sign and pointing to it at sporting events. You, you may assume it with things like that, but listen, it's a marvelous, amazing verse. Notice what it says, verse 16. This would have blown Nicodemus' mind when he said, For God so loved the world. That's the object of God's love. What is the object of God's love? The world. Now, Nicodemus and many of his fellow Jews, many of them, I can't say all of them, but many of them had been taught this, that God loved the Jewish people and he hated the rest of the world. And he looks Nicodemus square in the eye and he goes, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world. Do you believe it? Do you believe it that God loves uh, people down in Mexico? where our brother Ted Thayer, who's visiting with us today, is ministering right down there? Do you believe God loves the people in Nepal, where my own wife is there with the dental team to do ministry in evangelism, that God loves them? Do you believe that God loves the people on every continent and every nation all over the world? You better believe he does. For God so loved the world, it's not just us. It's not just our nation. It's not just our community. God so loved the world. And he loved them. And he gave his only begotten son to the world when the world was still the world. He didn't say to the world, clean your act up and then maybe I'll love you. No, he says, right now where you're at, I love you, world. I see you in your sin. I see you in your rebellion. I see you in your degradation. But I still love you. And therefore God did something, verse 16 says, that he gave his only begotten son. You know, it isn't that God so loved the world that he wished, that he hoped, that he formed a committee. God so loved the world that he actually did something. He gave. God is a giving God. That describes the expression of God's love and the gift of God's love. God's love just didn't feel for the plight of the world. How about this? For God so loved the world that he felt really bad for them. No. For God so loved the world that he gave. And what did he give? His only begotten son, the most precious thing possible to give, his only begotten son. That what? Verse 16. And whoever believes in him, that's the recipient of God's love. Whoever believes on him, believe. Now, we need to be very careful, and I'll be doing this throughout the Gospel of John. I'm making sure we define what belief is. It's not just intellectual agreement. If you merely say, yes, I believe that Jesus existed, I believe that Jesus died on a cross, I believe that Jesus taught some really wonderful things, that's not belief the way that the scriptures speak of it. Belief the way that the scriptures speak of it is to trust in, to rely on, and to cling to. That's what you have to do in regard to Jesus Christ. It's a conscious looking away from self and a looking upon Jesus Christ and to believe in 
Those are the ones who really receive God's love. I want you to think about this. God loves the entire world, but who really receives the benefit of that love, at least in the greatest sense? Only those who believe on him. Then he goes on, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves to rescue. God is a rescuing God. He sees people in trouble. He sees people in danger, both in this life and in eternity. And his entire function is to rescue them. And God has engineered the greatest rescue for humanity that the world has ever seen. He said, I see lost and fallen humanity. I see them suffering in the present. And I see their even greater suffering in eternity. And I will send my son to redeem them, to bring them out of this, to be the gift of God unto them. And what are we given to do? to believe on him, to trust him, to rely on, to cling unto Jesus. And then we can have that promise of everlasting life. My friends, you've got to admit, what an amazing thing, isn't it? What an amazing offer that Jesus Christ makes unto us. I I don't notice any qualifications in there. I I don't notice that you have to be of a certain race, you have to be of a certain intelligence, you have to be of a certain class, a certain economic status. I don't see that you have to be of a particular man or woman, young or old. None of those things matter. It's whosoever. The whosoever can be you. In a few minutes when I end this message, I'm going to give an invitation for anybody who wants to put their faith in Jesus Christ today. How could I not do that? How could I preach on John 3.16 and not give an invitation for people to receive Jesus Christ? Uh, they, they, they should you know, give me some kind of citation as a pastor in a negative sense for doing that. That would be pastoral malpractice to preach on this text and not give anybody an invitation. But friends, I want you to think about this. It's for you. And here's the heavy part. And I agree, this is heavy. If you reject it, who do you have to blame? This free offer of rescue in Jesus Christ is laid out to you. And the the gift is amazing. But the price for rejecting it is huge. Let me read on, starting at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Friends, I don't know if you underline things in your Bible, but why don't you underline that phrase in verse 17. Notice what it says. He says, for God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus did not come so that the world would be condemned. Now let me say, there is condemnation because of the coming of Jesus, but that was never God's intention. God made the gift big enough and the provision big enough that whosoever would come could put their trust in Him. He has to say, even though that's not why God sent the Son, it was not for the condemnation of the world, yet nevertheless, verse 18, he who does not believe is condemned already. You know, I would say that John 3, 16 is one of the most gracious, wonderful offers conceivable. Eternal life for everybody who believes. Yet the offer has inherent consequences for any who reject For any who refuse to believe, their refusal makes their condemnation certain. And what is their condemnation? Look at verse 19. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Friends, I know many people who have uh, intellectual objections to Christianity. And, And they know how to frame them. They know how to phrase them. They, they, they've read the works of the great atheists and agnostics of our own day, and they love to make their arguments, and you can kind of tell there's themes that go around. And I can't say this is true in every single case, but it's true in many cases. 
that all that intellectual posturing is a cover for a refusal to submit to God morally. Sometimes I wish somebody would just be honest. It's like, no, I don't really know if there could be a God, as they stroke their chin. Instead, they'd be honest and say, look, um, you know, there's this area of my life that I know the Bible says is wrong, and I don't want to bring it into submission to Jesus Christ. All right, well, at least we know where we're at. Do you realize how many people reject, not because actually they have any true intellectual difficulty, but their intellectual difficulties are a mask for a moral difficulty. At the bottom of it, they love the darkness more than the light. And if somebody stays in that condition, friends, here's the good news. If you're in that condition today, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there at all. You can be rescued out of it right now, right now. But if you stay in that condition, do you not condemn yourself? So if God says, here's the generous offer I give to you in Jesus Christ, say, no, I don't want to, well, then who is to blame? I love those powerful words in verse 21. Notice this, verse 21. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Do you love that phrase in verse 21? I do. He who does the truth. That's a wonderful thing to talk about whether or not you believe the truth. And that's a valid thing for us to discuss. Do you believe the truth? But let's leave that on the back burner right now. Let's talk more pointedly. Do you do the truth? Everybody who does the truth. And each and every one of us have the opportunity to do the truth. To live according to the light and not according to the darkness. We, we do the truth. We do the truth regarding ourselves. You know, you know what doing the truth regarding yourself is? It's to confess your sin and to repent before God. This is who I really am. I need you, God. That's the truth about yourself. You do the truth regarding Jesus Christ. You say he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. What he did on the cross really matters for me and for humanity. And that is the source of my rescue. We do the truth regarding self, regarding Jesus, regarding the cross. And we do the truth regarding the new life we have in Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, you, and I trust I'm speaking to most people here, you have new life in Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible's challenge is to you? Go out and live it. You go out and live according to the new man. You leave the old man behind, reckon him dead. You live according to the new person that Jesus Christ has made you. That is doing the truth. And if it's true for you, be happy about it and seek for somebody else to make it true in their life. Well, this is what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to pray, and at the conclusion of my prayer, I'm going to give people an invitation to receive Christ. What I'm going to do when I give the invitation is we're going to have our prayer team up front. See, the reason why I'm explaining this, I, I don't want to do this in any manipulative way. I'm not trying to you know, sneak one in on you or something like that. But what I'm simply going to do is when I'm done praying, I'm going to invite anybody who wants to receive Jesus Christ to come up and pray with somebody who is up here on our prayer team. You just have to get up out of your seat, go to the aisle, walk down, and pray with somebody up on our prayer team. And they'll know you and care about you and be able to speak to your life personally and pray for you.